All right, let's say a quick prayer here. Heavenly Father, here we are again, Monday morning, and just uh, reveling in the chance to open your word and to read from it and to study from it. And uh, just please uh, illuminate it to us that what we uh, see will be proper, that we'll understand it properly, and that uh, we'll uh, leave here edified in a couple hours. And we thank you for the gift of your word and especially for the gift of your son who is revealed in your word. And we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I, I don't know, a couple of you have come out to the beach for the, uh, the Sunday afternoon uh, service. Boy, am I tired. And uh, this week it is not going to be at the beach. It's going to be at my house and it's going to be a potluck. So if you're planning on coming out, don't go to Turtle Beach because, uh, because uh, just so you all know, 5.30 my house, potluck, but... Uh, and really short and basic sermon. It'll probably be the least New Testament sermon I ever do in my life. But uh, just quick and to the point, and that way maybe I can get some people to come that normally wouldn't come. But anyway, here we go. Chapter 32. Anybody start reading, please. 5.30. 530. 5.30, yep. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place... Mahanaim. Okay, just so you know, what is I am? Two I am is plural, that's right. And Mahanaim would be two camps or more than one camp, a plural of camps, all right? So some people will say, uh, yes, two camps. And the reason why is we're going to see that soon is that there's two things that are uh, done. But that, that would be correct. But Mahanaim would be a plural of camps, um, double camp, for example. Um, okay, go ahead, please. Jacob sent mess messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to Master Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. Okay, so it says that he sent messages to his brother Esau, and then it says, in the land of Edom. Well, his name was Edom because he liked the lentil soup. Remember, because Edom means red. So eventually, he moved over to the land of Edom, and it must be named after him. Yeah. Okay, But the land is also red. So maybe it was Edom before, and he thought, well, I like red. I'm going to where red is. Whatever. Anyway, I'm just telling you that uh, his name is Esau, but he's also known as Edom, and that goes back to the account of the lentil soup. And um, if you go to the area where Edom is, you'll see a lot of red clay, red soil, etc. Anyway, um, and uh, go ahead, verse 4. Well, I read it for. Oh, wait. Four. I read four. I, I, I already read four. Oh, okay. And he commanded them, saying, Speak. I, I have I cattle so. and. Donkeys and sheep and goats, maid servants and men servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I might find favor in your eyes. Okay, so he's sent them message that he. Um, uh, why is he doing this? Why is he sending him a message in advance? And uh, he's feeling him out. Yeah, he's. He, that's exactly because his brother, when he left twenty years early, promised to kill him when his dad was dead. Yep. And obviously, somehow he knows that Isaac is still alive, but the bitterness is still there, and he's trying to feel him out and determine what course of action he, he, he should take. Now, God has told him, go back to the land of your uh, fathers. I mean, he was instructed to do this. So it's showing a little bit of, what's the word, pensiveness or you know, yeah. reticence to go back there. But he is feeling out his brother to see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, six, please. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. That would do it right there. You know, it's not just your brother coming to see He's got 400 people gathered around him. And if you go to the account of David, when he uh, was uh, escaped from Saul, and he's out in the wilderness, he had like four, 600 people around him, and they would go and take care of business. Well, I, same kind of idea here is that he must think that He's, he's doomed. And what does it say? Verse 7, go ahead. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups. Okay, so you see the play that's going on here? This, these are the camps of the angel of God, two camps, and then you come down here and he's divided them into two camps. So it's kind of like a play on, on the spiritual and the, the uh, physical. Do you see that? 
from the first verses all the way you come to this verse, and there's two camps once again. So that's being played into what's being uh, uh, done here. Anyway, go ahead. And the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks the group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and to your relatives. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have, I have become two groups. And he did. He left there with nothing. He slept on a rock. He had Obviously, he had a, a thing of oil with him because he anointed the rock that he slept on. But he didn't have a great deal. He had a staff, but no, you know, staff is for tending sheep. He didn't have any sheep when he went up there. And now he's got all of these camels and donkeys and family and the whole whole thing here. And uh, But he is stating his fear to the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. The Psalms is full of it. Okay. But he's letting him know that you're the one that's directed me. Where was that? Back in verse um, uh, 9. You're the one that's directing me to go back here. So I'm letting you know my fear. Please help me out with this. Okay, 12. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. For I'm afraid he will come and attack me. And also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sands of the sea, which cannot be counted. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. Two hundred female goats and twenty male goats. Two hundred ewes and twenty rams. Thirty female cattle with their young. Forty cows and ten bulls. And twenty... <laughs> female donkeys and ten male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself. And he said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. Now why would he do that? Why would he say keep some space between the herds? Well, that, but also, if he's probably, if he's going to give them instruction in a minute is to tell them that you're a gift to uh, we are a gift to your uh, to you from your brother. So if he does it, if he gives one gift to his brother, his brother may stay mad. But if he gets another gift on the way and another mm -hmm. and another, eventually he's trying to wear down his brother. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get him to say, you know what? It, it, and it's the same thing as anybody. You say, yeah, I'm sorry once and some people will ignore you. And you say it three times and they finally say, yeah, all right. You know, and I think that's what he's doing here is he's breaking them down into individual details so that because if it's a gift it's a gift and he does give them instruction in a minute that we are a gift from your well he's not going to go ki killing his own gift so what he is going to do there is he is either going to kill Jacob and the family or nobody but he's certainly not going to he's going to take the plunder and there's a lot of it here so anyway go ahead what's the significance of the numbers he just chose a, a good number of, in other words, it wasn't just, yeah, it was a very generous offering, offering and it was... Pr the males, too. That's the what? He always outnumbered the males by yeah. two. Right, well... There's always half One males, male, so you can take care of two. Well, that's right. And so it, they have a different value based on what they are, male or female. And so that's why he's doing that. And... Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, anyway... That's how many it would take to service. I, I guess, I don't know, but they did have different value. And it's the same thing as, uh, you know, if you go into the law of Leviticus, they have different prices for different animals if you have a female animal as opposed to a male animal or whatever. So there's more value. I don't know anything about those things, but that's exactly what's going on. Is he's, he's basing it on, and probably he's taking half of what he has. I don't know that. You know, maybe he's giving him a third or a half, but a certain portion of what he has. Anyway, um, go ahead, 17. He instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, to whom do you belong and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are, sent, sent, they are a gift sent to my Lord Esau and he is coming behind us. Okay, does anybody see any doctrine that we bring up again and again and again in this class in those two verses? I don't expect you to, but when I read these, I really can't help but notice, especially in the first verse. He commanded the first saying, um, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Who are these in front of you? 
there's a certain doctrine, and I mention it almost every class we're in. An actual biblical doctrine is called divine election. And these people had no choice. And if you think about it, they are selected and they are now becoming a part of the people of Esau. I'm talking about the servants, not the animals. They have no choice in the matter. And the servants that are staying with Jacob will eventually become a part of the people of Israel. And that is divine election. Is. But in this case, it's Jacob's election. But God is the one that's determining the steps. And so when God selects, I mean, that's, it, this is the same thing as the second replacing the first. God is choosing the second over the first, all the way leading up to the Messiah to teach us something. Well, the same thing is happening here. These people are being sent out of the covenant people of Israel, and now they're going to be part of Esau, and they will never be a part of the covenant people of Israel. Eventually, though, Christ would come, and he would offer salvation to all the people of the world. But until he comes, those people are out. They're not part of the covenant people at all. As a matter of fact, they will become the uh, ancestors of people that are at enmity with yeah. Israel. And just imagine, you know, you might say, well, gee whiz, my grandfather got was given away to these people by the Jews, and we're going to go and kill them. So you don't know what kind of animosity was built up between these people that were given away. But do you see that in there? Those yeah. two verses to me are just, every time I read that, I can't help but think, talk about the... almost like uh, George Soros. You know who he is? Oh, yeah. He's a Jew. Oh, is he? he was yes, born he is. Jewish. I had no idea. And that, doesn't that figure? I was, you know yes. what? That just figures. I had no idea he was Jewish, but I could have, if you had said what ethnic group was he in, I would have probably, I'd never even thought of it, but it's just so typical. It is so typical of those people. I, you know, and I just don't understand it. How they, they're self-loathing. They, they have no morality at all. They have a desire to destroy everything around them. And then you get other Jews that are just completely the opposite. They're still Jews. They're not Christians, but they're just also a survivor of the Holocaust. Oh, he is? Unbelievable. And here is the guy that was, he was a participant in taking and trying to destroy Hungary and these other Eastern nations who persecuted the Jews while they were behind the Iron Curtain. The guy makes no sense. Yes, no, he did that as a young boy. He went through the neighborhood and identified two yes, Nazis. Yes, he did. Who his oh. fellow Jews were. He Whoa. pointed them out. So he said, it's I'm all about... Oh, that's, well, who does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of in the... Uh, uh, I, I, I should say it's not in the Bible, but it's in the movie The Ten Commandments. Who does that remind you of? From the, not in the Bible, but in the movie The Ten Commandments, one of the guys is selling his brothers to the Jews. Dathan, uh, remember, the guy that wants the, the precious lily, and uh, he's the servant of the Egyptian. Who's the Egyptian? Uh, 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 Vincent Price. And the Jewish guy under him is just a snake. And, you know, that's the kind of guy that George Soros is. Now that I know he's Jewish, it makes total, total sense to me. It just, yeah, no conscience at all. Robinson in that, I, don't, I thought it was in a Ten Commandment that may have been Ben Hur or something, where he was doing the same thing. Yeah, just unbelievable, you know, and that, it, that wouldn't be a part of a movie if people didn't really perceive that in the world around them. I mean, movies are based yeah. in reality. Yeah. And I'm sure we can find somebody in here that would fit that bill, and I can't right off the top of my mind think of anybody. He's but, got an arrest warrant that will live throughout his life mm. in uh, Great Britain. Unbelievable. Because he went Sorry. over there and started just devaluing their currency. Yeah. Oh yeah, Time that's right. Destroyed them. them. Sure. He destroyed them. Well, what about that knucklehead up in the New York Times, is it? Thomas Friedman? Oh. Siding with the Palestinians. And how many of these Jewish people oh, do this? Right. Their people are living in Israel. They're hemmed in by their enemies. And these Jewish people are saying, we need to give land to the Palestinians. And they have a right to return. If they give them a right to return to the land of Israel, which they never were there in the first place, but if they say all of these Muslims in these camps have a right to return to Israel, Israel would cease to exist in one day because they would be outnumbered and they would be voted out that day and it would be the end of Israel. And these... I better shut up because these Jewish people really, really, the ones that, the ones that are self-loathing Jews really, really bother me. And but they have no loyalty. No. Well, they, they, no morals, no loyalty. That's right. It's, 